That's my Lord, I love the creator of us all. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, was salatu was salamu ala Sayyidil Ambiya'i wal Mursaleen. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa man ittaba'ahum bi ihsanin ila yawmiddin amma ba'd. Fa'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقَصٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم إني أشكو ضعف قوتي وقلة حيلتي وهواني على الناس صدق الله العظيم وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن على ذلك لمن الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين. Respected علماء, respected قراء, respected حفاظ, brothers, elders, sisters, mothers, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. First of all, I would like to thank the Alignment Project, Alignment Dawa Project, and the Shah Jalal Masjid for giving me this opportunity to speak about an issue which is affecting us all in this country but looking at it from hopefully an Islamic perspective. How does Brexit affect Muslims? How do we look upon it from an Islamic angle? And where do we go from here in terms of the political situation in this country? Many people might remember when the vote happened during the month of Ramadan the Brexit vote many people thought that majority of this country will vote to remain in the country but it soon became apparent by the morning by four o'clock five o'clock six o'clock that the majority of the country, although by a few percentage, but majority of the country will have voted for us in this country to leave Europe. And this was totally unexpected. If we look at the preparations or the non-preparations of 10 Downing Street and even those who are advocating leaving Europe, if you look at their preparations, they, they were thinking that we will make a noise but we will not be out of Europe after the vote. But it so happened that majority of the country voted us out and we saw lots of upheaval within politics. The Prime Minister resigned, the Tory party was in turmoil, the Labour party is still in turmoil and people who voted out were thinking that majority of those who are from a background which is not white from people who look Asian people who look black people who look European they will be leaving the country very soon that's what people thought also we saw and we still see uh, economic turmoil that the pound has gone down Although some people are saying that when they go into Tesco's and when they go into Asda and they put the pound in the trolley, the trolley still comes out. So it's still there. The pound is still there. And uh, so whether we were going to stay in or out, you know, there were lots of debates going, in, uh, going on at the time. Um, when uh, on the day when the voting was going on, uh, people were sending uh, WhatsApp messages Insha'Allah. So we will remain in Sha'Allah. So they were sending these messages. And then when we went out, they sent another picture. We said, In Nalillahi wa inna ilayhi rajim. In Nalillahi wa inna ilayhi rajim. So people were sending funny, funny messages as well. So, you know, at the, at the end of the day, what's happened has happened. And it looks like, from a Muslim perspective, it looks like times are going to become more and more difficult for Muslims in this country because of Brexit. Um, we have seen a rise in Islamophobia since the vote. 
We have seen a rise in hatred towards people who do not look white, who do not look British. People, not only Muslims, even non-Muslims who are European, they are being taunted, they are being abused, they are being attacked. Attacks have gone up greatly since uh, the vote has happened. But what, what has happened has happened. Uh, the vote has taken place, the country has decided that we are going to go out of, Britain, uh, out of Europe. What does that mean for us? What is it that we need to learn lessons uh, from this Brexit? And as, as a Muslim community, one of the biggest lessons I think we need to learn is that we in the majority Muslim community feel that it would have been better for Muslims to stay in Europe because there are more Muslims around Europe because as a greater number we, we have access to the European Union we have access to the European Courts of Human Rights etc and that would have helped us in fighting some of the cases that happen in this country and sometimes if the government goes uh, towards the right wing then maybe in, in the European courts you might get some uh, justice so majority of the Muslim community was hoping that we would stay in we would stay in and majority of the Muslim community thinks that we would have been better off if we had stayed in and that is why people were shocked and we've seen the results of that result uh, we've seen the outcome of those of that result by seeing the hatred rising etc etc so majority of the muslim community wanted us to stay in especially in london majority of the london community whether muslim or non-muslim wanted us to stay in but unfortunately we are out it's very easy to blame others and this is one of the biggest mistakes that we make as a muslim community we are very quick on blaming others we will say oh you know it's the uh, far-right people who have voted us out we will say it is those people who hate uh, m foreigners who have voted us out those people who are against immigration who have voted us out and this is one of the biggest lessons we need to learn that times have in the last month two months times of, have become tougher for Muslims on the trains on the buses uh, just walking around people are saying they're being abused people are saying that they are being discriminated what does that tell us as Muslims we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the controller of the heavens and the earth this is our belief Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does what he wishes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be questioned what he does but we need to be questioned of what we do. Allah says in the Quran, وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَيَسْتَخْلِفَنَّهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ كَمَا اسْتَخْلَفَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ وَلَيُمَكِّنَنَّ لَهُمْ دِينَهُمْ الَّذِي ارْتَضَى لَهُمْ وَلَيُبَدِّلَنَّهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ خَوْفِهِمْ أَمْنًا يَعْبُدُونَ اللَّهِ شَيْكُرُ بِي شَيْئًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he promises in the 18th juz of the Quran, Surah Nur, uh, 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 one of the verses of the Quran in Surah Nur, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Allah promises those people who believe and those people who do actions that He will make them the Khalifa of this earth. So the question arises that is Allah's Quran true or not? Is there any question that there is any doubt in any one verse? Forget any one verse, any one sentence, any one letter. In the Quran, we do not have any doubt in this. Is that correct? We believe that every single word, every single sentence, every single verse of the Quran is true. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Those who believe and those who do good actions, Allah will make you the leaders of this earth. Allah will make you the people in charge of this earth then why are we not in charge? Wherever we look, there is turmoil within the Muslim community. Whether you look at Pakistan, whether you look at Bangladesh, whether you look at Kashmir, whether you look at Syria, whether you look at Libya, whether you look at Yemen, whether you look at any Muslim country, where there is great Muslim populations, you will see there is turmoil. So where is this khilafa? Where is this istihkam? Where are we in charge of what we are doing? 
And I'm not talking about ruling over people. I'm just talking about Izza. I'm talking about honor. I'm talking about living comfortably without any subjugation. Living with honor. Living in peace. Where are Muslims living in peace? There is no one. Very few. But if we look at the verse of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us what is the solution. وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Those people who have Iman, number one. You and I have Iman. But the second condition is وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ And those people who do good actions. What are good actions? Good actions is when we do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us to do. And when we refrain from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us to refrain from, that is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will become pleased with us as a Muslim community. And that is when the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends. That is when the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends. But we, we think that we have iman and then the help of Allah will come without the actions, without being obedient to Allah, that will not happen. And instead Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test us. And Allah is testing the Muslim community around the world. Some people are being tested more than others. If you and I were in the situation of the Syrian people, Allah knows what would happen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala relieve their suffering. Allah knows what would happen. And therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not put us in that situation. Say Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not, never ever bring that situation upon us. Amen. And not, never ever bring that situation upon our progeny until the day of judgment. Amen. This is a test which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put through certain people who he knows that they can take this test. And Allah says in the Quran, What we need to understand is we are now being tested in different ways. We are being tested in different ways. Allah says in the Quran and in the Hadith, He tells us, tells us that He is definitely going to test us. Verily we will test you. Verily, surely we will test you through hunger. Sometimes He will give some people hunger. We, you and I, need to make shukr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not testing us through hunger. I can say with confidence that within this area where Muslims are living, there are very, very few people who are being tested with hunger. If only, they, there might be none. Even if there are few, there are, you can count them on your hands. Allah is not testing us through hunger. Sometimes he will test us through fear that he will make you scared. Today Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing us in this country through a little bit of fear. What's going to happen after Brexit? What's going, when I send money abroad to Bangladesh, the pound has gone down. Not enough takas left going, going back home. Allah is testing us through fear. What is the economic situation in the future? Allah is testing us. This is one test. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, alhamdulillah, is not testing us through hunger. Min al khawfi wal ju'u wa naqsim min al amwal. Through decrease of wealth. Allah will test us through decrease of wealth. Sometimes your business goes up, sometimes your business goes down. Those who are in Europe, their business has gone up because of Brexit. Those who are here and they're doing business with Europe, their pound has gone down slightly. The euro has become stronger and it's become more and more expensive for them. But this is Allah is testing. Allah sometimes will take people's life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will sometimes take people's crops. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَبَشِّرِ sabirin Grant, give good tidings to those people who are patient. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised in the Quran that He will test us. He will test us. And this Brexit is from a Muslim perspective, we should see it as a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should see it as a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what kind of test is it? Each and every one of us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us to believe in Allah and to do certain actions. 
And after Brexit, lots of things have changed. The Prime Minister has changed. The Labour Party is going through turmoil. The pound is going up and down. All these things are happening. However, the question is, what are we doing? And what will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ask you and I on the Day of Judgment? What are you doing? What am I doing? And what will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ask you and I on the Day of Judgment? If we look, there were times when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us in the Quran where lots of prophets were tested. Hazrat Yusuf والسلام, was tested. He was thrown in the well. Did he give up hope? No. That is one of the lessons that you and I need to learn from Brexit. That just because we have gone out of Europe, just because now we are being discriminated in some areas, not everyone, but some areas, just because some people are saying that Muslims are like this and Muslims are like that, it doesn't mean we should become despondent. It doesn't mean we should lose hope. In fact, we should look at the story of Yusuf والسلام, and see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the depth of the well, from the depth of the well, where there is no hope of a person surviving, let alone becoming the governor of Egypt and being in charge of the finance of the governor of Egypt. But how? He had taqwa and he had patience. And he was obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He didn't lose his connection with Allah. He didn't lose his connection with Allah. He kept his connection with Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved him. Then he tested him again when a woman tried to approach him. And he refrained. And because of this taqwa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted him this honor. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested him. And even though he was not guilty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him to prison. He was sent to prison by the governor and he stayed in prison for many, many years. And then eventually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted him izza and honor. How did this change happen? If you look at the story of Yusuf والسلام, it happened through obedience to Allah. It happened through God consciousness. It happened through taqwa. It happened through patience. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted him honor. Today, by, through Brexit, each and every one of us, number one lesson is that you do not become despondent. You do not lose hope. Despite the things around us, this is an opportunity. An opportunity. Hazrat Yusuf والسلام, saw the opportunity when he was in prison. That now the governor is asking me this question. I will first clear my name and then I will give him the, the tools of dealing with the drought that is to come. And he put himself forward to say, I am Amin. I am Amin. I am trustworthy. You put me in charge and I will look after your finance. He was put in charge and he looked after the finance of the uh, governor of Egypt. And he, he was given honor by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, we find in the Quran the story of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. How many times he was tested? Many times. How many times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested as at Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, but he passed through five colors? Why? Because of taqwa. Hazrat Ayyub alayhi salatu was tested. Hazrat Yunus alayhi salatu wasalam was tested. Every single prophet was tested. Brexit is a test for Muslims and sometimes we in the Muslim community we will sit and we will we will digest and we will then discuss and we will discuss and we will discuss and we will discuss but we will not do anything about it we will not change ourselves to do something about it how much discussions have happened on whatsapp about Brexit how much discussions have happened outside on the streets about Brexit how much discussions we have had with colleagues about Brexit. We've talked about it, but what do we need to do? What are the things that are going to happen and how do we then uh, change ourselves? How do we then react? How do we then change the way the Muslim community approaches this country because of what is happening around us? How do we change? What do we need to look at? So sometimes we always complain about you know, Cameron is like this. And we will say that Theresa May is like this. And the government is like this. And these people are filling their ears and therefore we have no chance. 
That's the first thing that we need to put to one side. Don't blame others for what is happening around us. Blame ourselves. Bl don't blame others. Blame ourselves. The Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala, once he was approached and he was asked that, do you know, um, when people before you, the Khalifas, they were much better than you. Somebody said to Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala, the Khulafa, they were much better than you. So Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala said that the people who were under him were better than them, were, were better than you people. The people who are under Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman, they were better than you people. That is why the leaders were better as well. When our actions become poor, our leaders will become poor. When our actions become sinful, then our leaders will be the ones who will do oppression upon us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes does this to remind us to turn towards Him. Once there was a, a servant in the house and it was time for her to finish her work. So the maid was working in the house and it was nearly time for her to finish. It was nearly five o'clock. So while she was cleaning at the bottom, the, uh, the master of the house, he wanted some other work done. So he called her out from the balcony and he said to her that, Oi! So she looked at the watch and she saw that there's only two, three minutes left. And if I look up, he will give me more work so she carried on just cleaning the floor and she thought two three minutes left and then i will go home so the master from up there shouted oi and again she pretended he, she didn't hear and she carried on cleaning then he thought to himself that she's not listening so there was a plant there and in the plant was a pebble so she, he got a pebble and he threw the pebble on her so now because it was a small pebble she thought yeah, that didn't hurt i'll carry on and she kept on cleaning. So this time the master got a little bit of bigger, bigger rock and he threw it at her. Then she thought, next time I won't be alive. So she said, yes. So she looked up and she said, yes. What do, I, what, what do you want? So four times she ignored her master because initially it wasn't hurting. First he said, oi. Second time he said, oi. Third time he just threw a pebble. The fourth time he threw a rock then she turned towards the master this is what happens to the community when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to turn us towards him when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to turn us towards him then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you a little bit of difficulty but we carry on in our ways then allah gives a little bit more difficulty and we carry on in our ways then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says you're not listening now i'm going to put brexit upon you now I'm going to put Brexit upon you and now you see the discrimination that happens. Now if we don't turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we ourselves are much to blame. We ourselves are much to blame. Allah will not ask us about Brexit when we go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will not ask, ask us about who was the Prime Minister, who was not the Prime Minister. Allah will not ask us that what changes happened, did the pound go up or did the pound go down. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask about our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And sometimes we forget the reality of our purpose in life. When all these things are happening around us, we discuss all the peripheral issues. But we don't discuss the real issue, which is our connection to Allah. If we lose our connection to Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring leaders upon us that will remind us of our connection with Allah. Will bring leaders upon us who will remind us of our, of our connection with Allah. And if we still don't do it, then Allah will punish us through these leaders. And then we will have to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We will have to turn to Allah. When the Prophet sallallahu was in any kind of difficulty, he never used to look at the difficulty as a difficulty. Allah uh, the Prophet sallallahu he used to look at what is my connection with Allah? What, is, what have I done wrong? You look at the two main battles that happen within Islam. The battle of Badr and the battle of Uhud. The first battle of Badr took place in the second year of Hijrah. Second year of Hijrah. The non-Muslims came from Makkah to annihilate the Muslims. There was a thousand strong army. A thousand strong army who came to annihilate the Muslims. Came to annihilate the Muslims. And if these Muslims had been annihilated, then Islam would no longer have remained. The Prophet ﷺ came out to Badr. And this is where the non-Muslims met the Muslims. 
The Muslims, they didn't have much armor. They didn't have much horses. They were very poorly equipped and the non-Muslims were very well equipped. The odds were against the Muslims. Three to one against the Muslims. Plus, if you look at the armory, then you, you would say it was 10 to one against the Muslims. But the night before, what did the Prophet ﷺ do? The night before, the Prophet ﷺ raised his hands and he cried to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he pleaded to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He begged Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he cried in front of Allah that, Oh Allah, we are your poor servants. We are your poor slaves. Ya Allah, we have nothing. But you are the one who gives us victory. Oh Allah, grant us victory. We only have these people in front of us. 313 soldiers who fought on that day. But because of their obedience to Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down angels, sent down angels to support the Muslims in their fight against the non-Muslims. And the Muslims won the battle. Muslims won the battle. The battle was not won because of the armor. The battle was not won because of the numbers. The battle was not won because of the equipment. The battle was won because of the obedience to Allah and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he wrote a letter to Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when the Muslims had greater numbers and the Muslims were well equipped and they were on the verge of taking over Persia. Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he sent a letter to Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the leader of the army. And he said, remind the army that victory will not come because of our numbers and because of our equipment. When Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was Khalifa, he wrote this amazing letter in which he said, victory will not come because of our numbers and because of our equipment. Victory will come only through the obedience to Allah and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And our defeat will come if we are disobedient to Allah. Our defeat will come if we are disobedient to Allah. Today we look at all the means, all the means, but we forget the asal. We forget the real core of our existence. And that is obedience to Allah and the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yes, we have to lobby government. Yes, we have to take active participation in different events, in interfaith, multi-faith, and we have to mix with the communities, etc, etc. But we must never forget our core. And that core is obedience to Allah and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Battle of Badr was won because of the obedience to Allah and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by the 313 companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A year later, the Battle of Uhud took place in the third year of Hijrah. Again, the Muslims went down to Uhud. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam put 50 archers on a mount. And he said, Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala, he said, you are the leader, you are the Amir, you are the archers. You, I've given you 50 archers. Do not move from this place because the enemy will come around the back to attack us if you move from this place. Just cover the back through the archery. Prophet ﷺ gave so much emphasis about not moving. He said, do not move until I order you. Do not move even if we win. Do not move even if we lose and our corpses are being eaten by the eagles and by the birds. Do not move. The battle starts, the battle commences and the Muslims start to win the battle and the Muslims start to attack the non-Muslims and the non-Muslims are retreating, retreating, retreating. They're leaving their booty, they're leaving their possessions and the Muslims are taking over their possessions. The companions from the mount, they see this and they look at this and they say to Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala, oh, Abdullah, I think we have won, now we can move. He said, Abdullah said, no. Prophet sallallahu said, do not move. But unfortunately, some of the companions moved and they started coming down because they thought they had won. Now the movement of the companions should not be seen in a negative. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the companions do some things to teach you and I lessons. Whereas the companions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them a certificate. And it's not like any dodgy certificate. Sometimes we get people who have dodgy certificates. 
This is a real certificate. This is a certificate from Allah in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the Sahaba and He says, Radiallahu anhum waradu an. Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every single companion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with them. So we never say any bad word against any companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But this movement happened to teach you and I a lesson. When they moved, Khalid bin Walid radiallahu ta'ala who was not a Muslim at the time, he saw the opportunity. He killed a few archers that were left on the mount and then he came around the back with his horsemen. And then the Muslims were trapped in the middle. Non-Muslims here, non-Muslims here. They were sandwiched. And the Muslims lost 70 companions, including Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu, including the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa two front teeth were shaheed. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa it was uh, rumored in the battle that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa has passed away. This is how difficult that moment was. Why did that happen? The battle of Badr was won through the obedience to Allah and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa The battle of Uhud was lost or it was 50-50 in the end it was 50-50 because of the movement of the companions disobedience to the Prophet you and I daily how much disobedience there is towards Allah and the Messenger if Muslims can lose a battle for one small disobedience then what are we going to lose in the hereafter for disobedience to Allah and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? What are we going to lose in this world for disobedience to Allah and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? We are bound to lose. And all these difficulties that happen, we need to be introspection of ourselves. We need to have an introspection of ourselves. What is it that we are doing wrong? Don't look at others, don't point fingers at others. Let's point fingers at ourselves. Because that is what the Prophet ﷺ taught us. The Prophet ﷺ, he went to Ta'if. He went to Ta'if. Why? He, Khadija radiallahu ta'ala had passed away. Abu Talib had passed away. Prophet ﷺ had very little support in Makkah. The people of Makkah, the leaders of Makkah were not accepting Islam. So then the Prophet ﷺ thought, let me go to Ta'if, the next biggest city. Maybe the Banu Thaqif might accept Islam. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went and when he went he had so much hope that they will become Muslim and then he will have this support Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went into Ta'if and when he went to Ta'if he spoke to the three main leaders and all three of them rejected him one said this and one said that and one said this but not only did they reject him but they told the youngsters and the people to line the streets and stone the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Abused the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam whilst he was leaving Taif. What did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do wrong? Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the best of creation. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was obedient to Allah. There was no one whose sajda Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala loved more and will love more than the sajda of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There is no human being that Allah, there is no creation who Allah will love more than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's done nothing wrong. And yet he's being stoned whilst he's leaving Ta'if. He's being stoned whilst he's leaving Ta'if. And then he takes refuge under a tree outside of Ta'if. And his blood is fresh. Blood is fresh. His sandals are full of blood. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes so angry, so angry that he sends Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam and he says, the angels of the mountains I have brought them with me and all you have to say is yes and they will crush the people of Taif because Allah has become so angry that he has given you permission to crush those people and what did the Prophet ﷺ say? No, no, maybe their progeny might become Muslim later on, maybe they, these people might not understand but maybe the people later, their children, their children's children, their grandchildren, they might become Muslim. And then the Prophet ﷺ raised his hands and he made a dua. And that dua is powerful. That dua is a lesson for Brexit. That dua is a lesson for all the difficulties that we have within our lives. Whenever there is a difficulty, we need to look at this dua of the Prophet. ﷺ. And in this dua, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Allahumma inni ashku ilayka du'fa quwwati wa qillata hilati wa hawani ala nas. That, oh Allah, I complain to you about my, the feebleness of my strength. 
Oh Allah, I complain to you about my lack of resources. I complain to you about my disgrace in the eyes of people. Anta Rabbul Mustadafeen. You are the Lord of the weak. Wa Anta Rabbi. You are my Lord. Ila man takilani. Who, to whom are you entrusting me, O oh my Allah? Ila ba'idin yatajahamuni. To a stranger who is unsympathetic towards me. Ila aduwin malaktahu amri. To an enemy who you have given power to over the affairs. He is complaining about his own weakness. He is he is not complaining about the people of Taif. And what do we do when something wrong happens? We blame the leaders. We will blame David Cameron. We will blame Theresa May. We will blame Boris Johnson. We will blame Michael Gove. We will blame everyone else except ourselves. Although we are so sinful, although our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so weak, and here is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa who has the strongest connection with Allah, who has done nothing wrong in his life, who Allah loves the most, and he loves Allah the most, and after a difficulty has happened, who does he blame? Allahu Akbar. Allahumma ilayka ashku du'afa quwwati. Oh Allah, I, I complain to you about my own weakness. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says, I complain to you about my own weakness. Have we ever complained to Allah about our own weakness? When will we complain to Allah about our own weakness? When will we blame the affairs of the world on ourselves? Because the pious people, they blame the affairs of the world on themselves. And they raise their hands at night. And they pray to Allah and they say, Oh Allah, whatever is happening in Syria is not because of the people of Syria. It is happening because of my sins. Oh Allah, please forgive my sins. Whatever is happening in Yemen, whatever is happening in Kashmir, whatever is happening in Bangladesh, whatever is happening in Burma, whatever is happening around the world in Guantanamo Bay, it is happening because of my sins, O oh Allah. When have we raised our hands and blamed ourselves? And when have we ever thought to ourselves that now I need to change? Now I need to change. When have we thought about the connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because here the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa makes a profound statement. And this is what you and I need to learn from Brexit. And any other musibah, any other difficulty that comes our way, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa goes on further to say, إِلَّمْ يَكُمْ بِكَ عَلَيَّ غَذَبٌ فَلَا أُبَالِي Allahu Akbar. إِلَّمْ يَكُمْ بِكَ عَلَيَّ غَذَبٌ فَلَا أُبَالِي Oh Allah, if you are not angry with me, then although they have rejected me, although they have stoned me, although they have abused me, if you are not angry with me, then I am not concerned. I have no concern. I am not bothered that they have rejected me. I am not bothered that they have stoned me. I am not bothered that they have abused me. Because Ya Allah, the only thing that I am worried about is that you are pleased with me. And today the condition of the Muslims is that we want to please everyone else but we want to displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The only thing that we are not worried about is our connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything else we are worried about the connection with this person, we are worried about the connection with that person, we are worried about the connection with all of human beings but we are still not worried about the connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِلَّمْ يَكُمْ بِكَ عَلَيَّ غَذَبٌ فَلَا أُبَالِي if you remember this today, then inshallah I am happy that my message has got to you. Just remember this message. That the Prophet wasallam, after a difficulty, after a difficulty, did not blame the people of Taif. Did not blame their ignorance. Did not blame their attitude towards him. The Prophet wasallam, raised his hands and he said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, if you are not angry with me, then I have no concern. إِلَّمْ يَكُمْ بِكَ عَلَيَّ غَضَبٌ فَلَا أُبَالِي وَلَكِنْ عَافِيَتُكْ هِيَ أَوْسَعُ لِي I seek your protection. Your protection is more than, more, is vast enough for me. Your protection and your afia is what I am more concerned about. You protect me, Ya Allah, that's enough for me. And then the dua goes on where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asks, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be pleased with him. But the main message with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was saying in this difficulty that he had in Ta'if is that, oh Allah, you become, as long as you are not angry, I am not worried. Today, our Muslim community, we are concerned about everyone else except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
and the first lesson we need to learn from Brexit is that we need to strengthen our connection with Allah. The first verse which I mentioned, Allah promises those people with Iman and those people who do good actions, Allah will give you the honor in this world. Allah will give you strength in this world. Allah will give you places to look after and become Khalifa on this earth. But it will not happen if you do not become a true mu'min and if you do not have a'mal salihah so we need to strengthen our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa'ad Allah alladhina amanu minkum wa amilu salihat illam yakum bika alayya ghadabun fala ubali number one strengthen our connection with Allah what is our connection with Allah everything that happens around us Allah says in the Quran وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفُوا عَنْ كَثِيرٍ Allah says in the Quran ذَهَرُ الْفَسَادُ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ بِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِ النَّاسِ لِيُذِيقَهُمْ بَعْضَ الَّذِي عَمِلُوا لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْجِعُونَ The corruption has spread around the earth and on the seas why? بِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِ النَّاسِ Because of the actions of the people. وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفُوا عَنْ كَثِيرٍ The difficulty comes because of our own actions. And yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives so much. So difficulty will come, but we need to reflect on why that difficulty comes. What actions are we doing that is making Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala angry? What actions are we doing? that is displeasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what sins are we doing that we need to make tawbah for and then we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we ask for forgiveness so that Allah's rahmah can come after he forgives our sins remember the story of Musa alayhi salatu wasalam where Musa alayhi salatu wasalam and his people were roaming around in the desert for many many years and they could not find the rain was not coming there was a long drought as a Musa alayhi salatu wasalam he is a prophet of Allah he is a prophet of Allah and yet there is a drought he turns to Allah and he says oh Allah look at my people they are suffering in this drought oh Allah send some rain and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala converses with Musa alayhi salatu wasalam and he says to Musa alayhi salatu wasalam oh Musa how can we send rain when there is one sinner in your group of people who has been sinning for many many years continuously he's been sinning for many years and because of that person I have stopped the rain because of that person have stopped the rain just look at what happens when there is sin when there is sin Allah is stopping the rain so then Musa salatu wasalam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if he leaves your people then I will send the rain Musa salatu wasalam, gathers the people and he says I have conversed with Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that there is one person here who has continuously sinned every single day for 40 years and because of him the rain has not come that person needs to leave so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends the rain. That person realized that it was him. And he thought that if I leave the congregation, then everyone will know that I am the sinner. So he puts his head down and he starts to talk to Allah and he says, Oh Allah, you and I know that I am the sinner. Oh Allah, you and I know that I am the sinner. Oh Allah, if I leave these people, they will know that I am the sinner. Oh Allah, please forgive me. And he starts crying. And tears start trickling down his cheeks. And whilst tears start trickling down his cheeks, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends some clouds and rain starts to fall upon the people. These tears are so powerful that it can bring the rain which had been, they had been deprived of for so many years. As a Musa alayhi salatu wasalam looks around and he says, nobody has left the congregation. Oh Allah, nobody has left. How come the rain has come? He said, I had deprived the people from rain for so many years because of that person. But I have brought the rain because of that person. I have brought the rain because of that person. Oh Allah, that person, who is he? Show me who is that person. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, Oh Musa, I had concealed him for so many years despite his sins. Do you think I am now going to show him after he has made tawbah? I won't show you who he is because then you will know that he was a sinner before. Allah is a concealer of all sins. So we need to make tawbah to Allah. We need to turn to Allah. The other lessons uh, briefly that I will mention uh, because I have to finish. One, turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Two, we need to engage with people. We need to engage with the community. People who don't, if you look at the majority of people who hate Muslims or who hate immigrants, they don't know immigrants, they don't meet immigrants, they don't meet Muslim people and they go by headlines. Majority of people who live in London, 
they have connection with Muslims, they have connection with immigrant people. That is why you will find that majority of people in London, they voted to stay in and they have no problem with immigration. But the people who have voted out and they complain about immigration, they don't meet with immigrants, they don't uh, converse with immigrants, they, we don't open our masjid. Alhamdulillah, here we do, but I'm, I'm talking generally, we don't open our masjid to local people. They don't know what happens. In Devon, there was a mosque and uh, last year, two years ago, there was a school trip, just like they take them to church, they take them to the synagogue. The letter went home to the parents that we are going to take the children to the mosque. So the parents complained and stopped the children from going to the masjid just for a school visit. So when they were asked, and this was in the news, this was in the newspapers. When they asked the parents, why have you stopped the children? He said, well, there'll be bombs there and there'll be guns there. <laughs> there'll be bombs, because that's the perception that the media is giving them. And unless you talk to people, they will not know. Open your masajid, open our masajids, talk to people. Because ignorance, it's ignorance that breeds hatred. And if we don't break that ignorance, ignorance will only break through education. How do we educate people? By meeting with them. So another lesson that we need to learn is that we need to meet people, we need to speak to people, we need to engage with people. We don't have to change our ways, we have to stay Muslim. But we have to speak to people, we have to engage with people. A third lesson, which is an amazing lesson to learn, is that if we look at the Conservative Party after Brexit, it was totally in turmoil. The Prime Minister left, the leaders were fighting, Gove uh, and uh, Johnson and all the others were fighting, infighting, and it, we thought that the Conservative Party is in big trouble. But within two weeks, within two weeks, one dropped out of the leadership race, the other one dropped out of the leadership race, and they made Theresa May the leader. Why? Because they know that in unity, they will be stronger. In unity, they will be stronger. They stopped the infighting within two weeks. And they had a new leader in two weeks. Our Muslim community needs to learn that lesson. There is too much infighting. And we don't want to give up this or that. We don't want to give up our small patch here. We don't want to give up our small patch here. There is so much that the Muslim community agrees on. Islamophobia is a threat to Muslims. We agree on this. But we can't share a platform because this person is from this Jamaat and this person is from this Jamaat. Whereas the Conservative Party, they will get together, even though they disagree on some points, but on this point, one point, they will say, okay, we, we, we can get together. On this point, we can get together. They will leave their small differences, but for the bigger picture, they will get together. The Muslim community in this country has to get together and put their jamaats to one side on the bigger issues that affect Muslims and Islam. And if we don't do that, just like we are suffering now, we will continue suffering for many, many years. The Conservative Party taught us a lesson after Brexit that unity will give you strength. Muslims have to unite on the bigger issues to tackle the com uh, co bigger community issues, to tackle the bigger Muslim issues so that we can at least be stronger and we can have some strength in this country. So there are quite a few lessons. But the biggest lesson, like I said, we have to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is our lack of connection. It is our weak connection that has brought this about. Uh, about uh, uh, but there are opportunities. And those opportunities is that we will open our masajid. We will talk to people and they will learn about Islam. These are opportunities for Muslims. We must take these opportunities and not become despondent, not become tired, not become or this is going to happen now and this is going to happen. No, we have to seize the opportunity and make this a positive for Muslim community. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to understand. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillah rabbil alameen subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika wa nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta wa nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik. Jazakallah qayyitu al-Shaykh Yunus Dudwala Ta'ala 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 Ta'
Wa alaykum as Is there a way that the leaders of the masjids or the Muslim communities in every borough can come together to some form of gathering and discuss these issues regarding Brexit? I'll repeat the question from Brother Anush. He asked, is there a way that all the Muslim communities and leaders in the Muslim communities can come together to form a platform so we can discuss these wider issues across the communities? So there is a way, but whether people take up that way is a different issue. Yeah? So it's very easy for Muslims to get together and sit down. Let's invite them and they sit down. However, they have to put their pride away. And that's the way. And the problem is Muslims in different jamaats, different um, corners, they, they have their kursi, they have their chair, and they don't want to let that go. unless. We as a Muslim community learn how to leave our pride, leave our kursi for the betterment of the Muslim community and be happy to make someone else a leader who is more uh, worthy of that position. Until then, nothing will change, unfortunately. So there is a way, but it's up to the Muslim leaders to find that way and to make it happen. The way is there. But majority of the times it's the pride, it's the, sometimes it's the background, I'm Pakistani, I'm Mongoli, I'm Gujarati, and that sometimes becomes a barrier. All these things have to be left on the side and we need to move forward or else we're never going to move forward. Is there any other questions? Are we all Muslim are stubborn? We know the result what is bad and what is good for us. And the ulamas, as I said, Jamaat, this Jamaat, this Jamaat, when it comes to the straight and are we all stubborn, are we not moving on? So the Sheikh has asked, as we were all Muslims, we know which is right and which is wrong, but we are still very stubborn in our own communities, in our own groups. And he asked, why? Why is that we Muslims are stubborn and we don't unite? <laughs> yes, stubbornness is a... Uh, is a disease of the heart and because we don't concentrate on the heart and we concentrate on the outer uh, the chair. It, it, yeah but also in deen as well so there's two aspects of deen one is the external and one is the internal external performing salah um, looking after the masjid etc etc but there's an internal part which is a heart and there are many diseases jealousy hatred, um, stubbornness, all these diseases, if you don't make an effort in working on rectifying these diseases, they will always remain. And unfortunately, many, many leaders, they don't make an effort on the internal part of their Islam. So therefore, they think that this is the most important part, and what I am doing is the only way and the right way. And until there's two things. One is uh, this internal part of the deen which people neglect. So the, the uh, internal part of the heart. And secondly, we have an elder generation who are used to certain ways. And slowly, slowly the younger generation is coming to the fore. Uh, you know, the MCB uh, general secretary for the first time is somebody who was born in this country. So slowly, slowly, the younger generation will look at what is necessary for this country, especially for Muslims, and hopefully things will change. But until then, um, it might take a bit, a bit of time, unfortunately. Is there any other questions? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Basically, is there a way of persuading so-called uh, management committees to allow such talks. This is this is a good example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, based on the work from today, it, it was good for talk, and everyone hopefully kind of could, could basically benefit from what you just said. Unfortunately, in so many messages, such a talk will never be allowed. The brother has said. Uh, he has asked the Sheikh if there is any way of influencing the masjid communities 
across the UK to allow such talks and such platforms where we can speak more freely and discuss these issues. And he also praised the talk and praised Sheikh Yunus for discussing what he did discuss and the matters that he brought upon and the solutions. See, um, it, it's something, again, which goes back to the management, who is in the management committees. And unfortunately, in many mosques around the country, elders are still looking after the masajid. And although we can criticize the elders, we must al always praise the elders for what they've done in this country. If it wasn't for the elders, then you and I might not be sitting here in the way that we are sitting here, because they are the ones who built the masajid, they had the fikr of the masajid, they had the thought of making sure that we had masajid, madrasas, etc, etc. And alhamdulillah, they have done what they needed to do at the time. Unfortunately, it's very difficult for them to leave that, which is the problem. Um, I was speaking to an imam from America recently, a couple of weeks ago, and he was saying how in America, the masajid are not only masajid, they are community centers. And one of the challenges for us as a Muslim community is that we are here, but there are many Muslims who are outside who are on the verge of losing their faith. Forget masajid, coming to masjid. They are on the verge of losing their faith. Atheism is our biggest challenge in this country at the moment. What are we doing? How can we attract people to a masjid? They will not come to the masjid unless you make it into a community center, unless you attract people to subjects or things that happen which they feel comfortable with and then slowly slowly their deen will pick up he was saying that they have but they have more space there but they were saying that they had ba basketball uh, uh, courts within the masajid area they you know at, at tarawi time there were youngsters who were playing instead of playing tarawi but in america they they allowed it because they thought at least they're next to the masjid now, i'm not saying that should happen here but it's something that we really need to think about is how many youth are coming to the masjid and how many youth are we losing and the management committees need to take heed of this um, you know it, it might still take a little time but I, I, I see more hope inshallah the, there are many mosques now who are taking on younger management committees and they've been brought up here they see the challenges and they will address the challenges inshallah Jazakallah khair. Um, we'll wrap up the question and answers there and we'll ask for the last few words from our director Sheikh Qazi Lutfur Rahman who is the director of Alam and Da'a project and also the Imam of London Central Mosque in Regent's Park. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. I'd like to extend my gratitude to our beloved Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Yunus Dudwala for giving us time and coming, sacrificing time and coming to step in Shandala Masjid. Jazakallah khairan, may Allah bless him, reward him in abundance. Inshallah, we also request him to come more and more to our programs. Also, I would like to say a uh, special thanks and Jazakallah khairan to every one of you here for coming and taking our program seriously. <coughs> This program is organized by Alignment Dao Project in affiliation with Stepney Shandil Alamos and Cultural Centre. Uh, it happens every month. It's a monthly event that we do. We uh, invite scholars from different parts of UK nationwide and inshallah soon we'll be inviting scholars from abroad as well outside UK. So uh, we'll have this beautiful, noble monthly event once again in September, it happens usually on first Sunday of every month. First Sunday of every month. So I request every one of you to come and join us, inshallah, whenever you can, and support us, especially with your duas and in whatever means you can. Jazakumullah khairan, Jazakumullah, uh, Jazakumullah khairan, Sheikh Yunus, and everybody else. And I'm going to request him to make a small dua, inshallah, and conclude. And before we leave, we still have about, I think, 30 minutes before Maghrib. We have, inshallah, refreshment available, uh, beautiful, delicious biryanis. Uh, so please enjoy the biryani before you leave. This is a special treat from Alignment Da'a Project and the brothers of Alignment Da'a Project. Exactly. Barakallahu alaykum. Allahumma lakal hamdu kamayim maghili jalali wa shikwa azimi sultanik. 
اللهم لك الشكر كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك وعظيم سلطانك لا اله الا انت سبحانك انا كنا من الظالمين الف لام ميم الله لا اله الا هو الحي القيوم وعنت الوجوه للحي القيوم اللهم صل على سيدنا ونبينا مولانا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا ونبينا مولانا محمد وبارك وسلم ربنا اتنا في الدنيا حسنه وفي الاخره حسنه وقنا عذاب النار ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد اذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمه انك انت الوهاب ربنا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الابرار اللهم رب ارحمهما كما ربياني صغيرا اللهم انا نسالك رضاك والجنه ونعوذ بك من سخطك والنار اللهم انا نسالك العفو والعافيه والمعافاه الدائمه في الدين والدنيا والاخره اللهم ثبتنا على الايمان واحينا على الايمان وامتنا على الايمان واحشرنا يوم القيامه مع المتقين مع الايمان يا الله whatever we have said ya allah accept it from us ya allah whatever mistakes we have made ya allah forgive us for our mistakes ya allah ya allah we are in a situation in this country ya allah where there are difficulties but there are many opportunities ya allah ya allah save us from these difficulties ya allah save us from all kinds of discrimination ya allah save us from all kinds of hatred towards us ya allah ya allah and help us to take maximum opportunity to bring people towards islam ya allah and help them to understand what is islam ya allah ya allah the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam wished that every single person in the world became muslim ya allah ya allah grant us that fikr as well in our hearts ya allah ya allah grant us that kind of understanding ya allah grant us that kind of fikr in our hearts that we also call people towards islam ya allah we also pray for people that they understand islam ya allah ya allah remove the hatred within this world ya allah wherever people are suffering ya allah relieve their suffering ya allah especially the people of syria ya allah especially the people of kashmir ya allah people of bangladesh and burma ya allah the people in guantanamo bay ya allah in central africa ya allah wherever people are suffering ya allah relieve their suffering ya allah ya allah keep us in peace Ya Allah, keep us in in goodness, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, whatever we have said, Ya Allah, accept it from us. Whatever mistakes we have made, Ya Allah, forgive us. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta as-sami'ul alim. Wa tab alayni ya maulana innaka anta at-tawwab ar-rahim. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala khayri khalqihi. Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in bi rahmatika ya rahman rahimin. Amen. 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 Amen